The sound was driving him crazy. Monotonous, muffled duds were resonating throughout his head with full pain. The pain wasn't too strong, nothing unbearable, but that sound, more than anything else, he wanted the sound to just stop. Thud. Nevertheless, the knocking sounds didn't end. He knew it well enough because he himself was their origin. Thud, thud, thud. The noise of his slipper was hitting the rear of his desk over and over again, like a huge fluffy moth frantically ramming against the window glass. He wanted, actually he wanted plenty of things. He wanted to pay the rent in, this, in time this month, not to displease his landlady again. He wanted to finish the script, at least in draft, because a draft is way better than nothing, something one can work with. And he wanted to sleep. No, not quite that. The problem, a serious one, was that he didn't really want to sleep. He leaned back in his chair and rubbed his eyes shut, pressing his eyeballs until dancing pill lights appeared. Of course, he took the sleeping pills. One healthy eight-hour sleep gives way to a not-so-healthy five-hour nap, then a three-hour eyes-shut break, and then goes away entirely. You stop thinking about how this will impact your liver. You just want to sleep. You need to sleep, actually. Especially if you have already taken an advance payment for the first part of a gig, and then the goddamn text won't just write, write itself. However, if the text could, in fact, write itself somehow, he would probably lose his job. He didn't have any illusions in this regard. As soon as neural networks get smart enough, he and dozens of other ghost writers will vanish into morning mist of a new era of, in literature. He didn't have much in the name of, of, of a name or connections, only some skill and a knack to meet the deadlines for the most part. The client was content with this, and he was content with the pay, so everything went well until the pills started failing him. Blam. This time, the tick got too strong. His foot jerked and hit the board with a very noticeable pain. It seemed like he even heard his toes crack. He muttered a short curse and rolled the chair away from the desk, although he knew. Now that his attention was not fixed on the blank text file, the tick should go away all by itself. It's funny how the consciousness is detached from the body. He often thought about it, especially while having insomnia. It's like you're working as a team, but your partner starts pulling something. You seem to have common goals, but when all hell breaks loose, you are suddenly left alone with it, and your partner is more interested in watching the fire than fighting it. In the end, you have no idea what's on his mind. Well, at least there won't be any more knocking. Good. A small window at the far side of the room flashed white for a moment. A storm? Now that he thought about it, the day was hot. The vicious stagnant air filled the room. This and the barely audible squeak of an overheated network filter. He became sensitive to such things when he couldn't sleep for a long time. It made the entire room seem to vibrate a little. Like a cocoon that's about to hatch. Actually, that did sound like a good line. He rolled back to the table and was about to write that thought down, but paused over the keyboard. He remembered the individual words and the general idea, but the sentence had already slipped away. This time, the white light seemed to fill the entire room. 
Then a thunder followed, resembling a low gut roar of something large and famished. Good lord. He called to God way too often for someone who never goes to church. Just a habit he inherited from his mother. A furious patter of raindrops pounded on his window. There's no way he could work like this. Not now. But maybe it's for the best. Since he was a little boy, he, swept, he slept well during the storms. I had to seize the moment. He groped for another packer of sleeping pills. It's nice to have your working tools at hand. Pop the pills into his mouth and open the window to hear the steady patter of the rain. Then he went to bed and collapsed on top of the bed sheets, his clothes still on. <sighs> he could tell by the sound of water. The water had flooded the wooden window sill and was trickling down to the floor. He decided that was a small price to pay. He felt a pleasant chill of cloth beneath his cheek. The wavering haze was gradually fading from the room, yet the sleep did not come. He tried to take off his shoes, change position, take a pillow, cover himself, throw the pillow away to the other side of the room. Nothing helped. He just laid there with his eyes closed. And though his closed eyelids felt heavy, he knew it was an illusion. All in vain. He's not sleeping. He can't sleep. Thud. First, he thought he was imagining things. Thud, thud, thud. Sometimes the knocking paused, but it never stopped completely. The sound came below from the first floor. Someone was banging insistently on the door. And with each thud, he could feel the rage building up in like a tight knot of pain around his stomach. He is trying to sleep. Is it really that hard to just leave a man alone? At least at night, at least in the house that he pays for, specifically so that nobody would bother him. He opened his eyes, easy, just as he thought. Sprang to his feet and ran down the stairs. Something was boiling inside him. Halfway to the door, he took a turn to the cupboard, pulled out an old baseball bat. He wasn't likely to actually use it. He asked himself if he would as he, would, as he reached for the door handle. No, he certainly wouldn't. But he's angry, and he wants the night guest to learn it. What the hell? The rain was still pouring, or rather it was actually getting stronger. As his mother would say, and the floodgates of heaven tore open. His mother used to say lots of things. That was on the list of reasons why he had to, had to rent this overpriced house where anyone could start banging the door in the middle of the night. A cat, for example. What the hell he said it this time again aloud a cat was standing on his porch she looked like a purebred British short hair in all respects except for the color aside from the smoky gray head it seemed as if she dropped into a vat of white paint while her lower part was dipped into a black one wet fur clinging clung to her small, rather skinny body, dripping with water. The cat could have probably slipped into the house as soon as the door opened, but instead she froze, as if waiting for the host to say something. I mean, for me, I would, uh, refuse, but I feel like that's not interesting, so let's let her in. It was cold outside, much colder than one might think. He didn't feel angry anymore. All right, come in. He stepped aside, freeing the doorway. The cat didn't move. So, you don't want to, huh? He was about to say fine, then close the door, go back up to the second floor, and lie in a suffocating half-sleep until morning. When he finally realized what was wrong, the bat. He threw it away, aiming for the sofa, but missed. The bat clattered on the floorboards. The cat followed it into the darkness with her round, yellow eyes. The sounds didn't frighten her. He sighed. I won't hurt you. Come in if you want. The cat raised her eyes at him. For the first time he actually saw and couldn't help admiring how big and yellow they were. 
Cat's pupils were also large and incredibly round, like two, two full moons in an eclipse. Just as he was about to close the door for the second time, the cat murmured something and fluttered into the house, butting him with her wet head as she passed by. He smiled. Strictly speaking, at this very moment his line had ended. If the laden lady had found out, and he was sure she would, he'd have to look for a new place to live. There are plenty of lonely, bored seniors in the neighborhood, he thought and they only have two hobbies, observing and reporting. The subject and the recipient aren't that important. Well, it's fine. Maybe he'd leave for the suburbs. Maybe he'd move to an apartment since him getting privacy didn't work out anyways. The rain was getting stronger still. He closed the door. <clears throat> the cat explored the house with cautious curiosity stopping by different objects as if trying to understand their purpose. Watching that was amusing, so amusing he even forgot about the stain. When he remembered, it has, it has already spread out, a dark spot of water in the place where the cat clung to him. He pulled the wet cloth away from his body and stared at it blankly for a moment, then almost groaned aloud. The cat was soaked, so she probably got a lot of dirt in the house. He decided not to turn on the light. He had enough disappointment for the night. Instead, he went to get a towel. All right, come here. The cat turned her head to the voice in frozen place. She was examining the TV. A lifeless black mirror of plasma panel. And a lacquer frame that he hadn't even touched since moving in. In the reflection, the cat herself looked black. She gave him a long, appraising look, and then, with a suddenly eagerness, trotted towards him, deftly avoiding the obstacles. He was surprised. Maybe the cat decided he was more interesting than the TV. Or maybe she acted out of respect for her host's will. Anyway, he felt grateful. Finally, someone he can actually negotiate with. Suddenly, he thought how nice it would be to crawl under the blanket with a warm ball of fur. It would surely have helped him fall asleep. As a child, he had a cat, gray, huge, brash, immensely ugly, and equally beloved. He often fell asleep hugging him. The cat's name was Timo, and he faded into a June night many years ago. The cat bumped her wet head against him once more. He thought that cats usually shake off the water themselves. Usually, but perhaps not always. Hey, easy there, you're all wet. The cat looked up at him with her moon-shaped eyes and murmured something again. Do something about it then. He smiled and got to work. He had to squeeze the fur thoroughly so the towel, the towel soon turned into a wet rag. Should he? I mean, we spent the last, like, five minutes talking about this wet cat, so I'm, I guess we... I, I guess we gave the cat. That won't do. I'll give you a bath. <sighs> As he carried her to the bathroom, the cat stayed still on his arms, a warm and incredibly light body pressed against his chest. He was expecting the cat to bring out the claws any moment, maybe as he opens the door. Now? Or as he turns the light on? Maybe this time? But nothing happened. The cat glanced around the new room and looked at him again with her intelligent, almost human-like gaze. Not a single mussy... Mussy. <laughs> mussy. <laughs> Fucking mussy. Dude. Not a single muscle in her body had moved. She was curious, and that's about it. She trusts me. He was about to ask her if she knows where they were and what was going on when it happened next. That was just too much. So, uh, it, it shouldn't be very difficult. The two of us man can manage this. Uh, wh what do you think? He read somewhere a cat should get used to the new surroundings before bathing. Fear is born out of the unknown. In that regard, people haven't gone too far from cats. New scents, unfamiliar objects, and the splashing of water. These are just shadows under the bed that will fall back if you get a better look at them. He carefully put the cat on the floor. She looked around the room again and returned her questioning eyes to him. It seemed like she got comfortable, though. 
He turned on the water in the shower and felt a gentle touch. The cat was already loitering around his feet. She was curious indeed. The shower isn't so bad compared to the rain, is it? Uh, the joke came out a little awkward. He felt embarrassed and he didn't know why. just a cat. Maybe it was because of how the water glistened on her skin, or how she was looking at him from under half-flowered lashes. She was actually watching. He met her eyes and each time he felt the shame burn through him, but that shame was thick and sweet. He was a little dizzy. His hands slid over her smooth, wet skin, and each time he would ask himself, was it really necessary? Then he would feel her eyes on him, and his thoughts would melt, running down her thighs with the lather, disappearing between her neat toes. Oh, uh, what, what the fuck is this? The bathroom shimmered, molten, bright, pulsating with light, or darkness. He felt he was losing, losing his balance and pulled his hand away, but she returned and pressed it into a wet, hot skin covered in a soapy veil. She guided it. I thought that... I get that they replaced the cat with a, like a person, but I'm pretty sure it's a cat. He couldn't remember how he ended up living in the room again. The cat was napping peacefully in his arms. He absently ran his hand down the cat's wet back, tracing the bumps of her spine with his fingers. I should get you some food. Let me see what I have. He got up with just a tad bit difficulty. Nothing he couldn't handle. Still, his body felt unusually heavy and unwieldy. He had to give the cat something to eat. He will lie down afterwards and then, hell, maybe he'll even fall asleep. Maybe he should have gotten a cat from much earlier. A ball of fur with a pair of moon eyes and a velvety voice that you can always negotiate with. And that's about it. That's kind of funny. He could have avoided all that suffering. If only he had a cat. The kitchen blurred before his eyes. He got to the refrigerator and opened it, squinting from the light and leaning on the door way harder than he was supposed to. If the landlady was around at the time, she would have told him exactly so. Don't lean on the door. After all, this is her house and her refrigerator and everything should be neat and tidy in case she has to move new tenants in. Perhaps the landlady would have even warned him about the milk. The milk itself is completely harmless. Unless, of course, you are allergic to lactose. But there is a special kind of lactose-free milk, right? What matters is the bottle. Bottles, much like cats, can vary greatly, but this particular one was made of glass. If only the landlady was here, she would have probably told him not to touch the bottle. Because he's falling on the floor and the bottle might break, and then the milk will spill and he'll have nothing to feed the nice cat he found. Or rather, it was her who found him, and very timely because he was lying on the floor. He'd been lying there for some time and would have been lying still if he hadn't felt the slight touch of, touch of something hot and rough on his cheek. It was almost like a dream, although of course comparing sleep with fainting isn't quite correct, no matter how you look at it. The floor beneath him was surprisingly hard, cold, and wet. He felt all of these three qualities clearly and was afraid to imagine what would happen if he tried to move. But he had to move one way or another at least to see what's up, because something hot and rough was still sliding up his cheek, gradually creeping up to his ear. He felt a warm breath and then a cautious bite. Ouch! He jumped on the spot. A shadow rushed to the side and then calmly began to lap milk from a puddle. What are you doing? What are, you, what are you doing? What are you doing? The cat. Oh, what are you doing? <laughs> okay. The cat looked at him briefly and licked her lips. 
猫でもないのにそんな状態で寝転んでるなんてねそれにミルク漬けになってるし Well, you're right. I let you down and had to get my punishment. I let myself down too. Good lord, now there's cleaning to do until the next advent, like his mother would have said. I'll go get a rag. Stay here and don't and don't ruin what's left of the kitchen while I'm gone. Cat watched him go with a skeptical look. <clears throat> When he returned with the bucket, the cat was gone. In the kitchen, something exciting is happening. Take. You will need a blade. Did you take the pills? Scratch out the entrails? The Egyptians widely used honey for embalming and preserving food. Later, the recipes were adopted by the Greeks. Also, add a teaspoon of apricot jam, a walnut, and a little cinnamon. For baking, put a teaspoon of butter on top of microwave for five to seven minutes at full power. Don't listen to them scream. Bon appetit. The next time he saw her was in a few days, or maybe in a week. He always had a bad sense of time, especially when he was immersed in his work. He still couldn't sleep, but at least he was making some progress with the script. It was a narrative game project, as the customer called it, but actually meant do whatever you have to finish it on time, else forget about the payment. And so he did, although he was resentful and that got in the way a lot. The reason of those feelings was the cat. He knew how stupid that was, but he couldn't help it. He forgave her for the bite almost immediately. That wasn't the thing. He was bitter about how the cat ran away, despite him trying his best to take care of her. She was nowhere to be found in the house, so he immediately thought about an open window on the second floor. Maybe he should have closed it. He dwelled on the thought for a while. He even approached the window at some point. But in the end, he decided not to do anything about it. He was hoping. There was no shame in that. It's not the same as you turn up ten and start eyeing girls. The cat would come back. And she did. He had just settled himself on the sofa with some book. Some was the word, as he couldn't remember a thing from the actual cover, even though he read the title several times. The symbols were floating before his eyes, and of course he couldn't make out a word. No wonder, considering he didn't sleep at all. When you think about it, it was surprising he could write in this state. Either way, he was barely following the book, so he wasn't upset at all when a fluffy head butted his hand. Hey, I'm trying to read here. He complied. You were absent for so long. I thought you won't be back. There's a big difference between expectations and hopes. He had learned that well. Why did you leave? Did I do anything wrong? The cat stayed silent. Well, you'd be happy she's back. All right, it doesn't matter that much. I'm happy to have you back. After all, there was no point in this grudge from the start. Nobody gains anything by holding on to small grudges and staying blind to what they really feel. You wouldn't have won anything. It's not a damn lottery. The cat rubbed against his arm again. He put the book down and gently placed her on his lap. A locket around her neck, unexpectedly cold, touched his skin. Then he got a hunch. Did you go home? 
well, someone must be caring about you if you put that if they put that collar on. This time it was him who stayed silent. The cat buried her head in his stomach. Want me to take it off? He nodded because if you think about it, that was really a reasonable choice. The cat's fur was thick and smooth, very pleasant to the touch. He wanted to bury his face in it and find out what it smelled like. But she smells like, okay, dude. Do you have a name? And what's yours? The cat looked at him carefully, with her bright yellow eyes as if, as if saying, take a guess. But she didn't actually say anything. On her locket was a small engraving, a crescent moon that was dimly shining in the pale light coming out of the window. Celine. The cat looked up at him, and her pupils flickered into two full moons in an eclipse. She rode against his arm one last time and stood up, stretching, arching her back. Don't close the window on the second floor. I won't. She left, but the name stayed with him, in and around the house. Celine. So hummed the glass, white in the moonlight. So whispered the long shadows of the branches outside the window. Okay, I guess focus on the name. What is Celine? For some reason, the question bothered him. He vaguely remembered it. It had something to do with this mythology. Mythology. Such things never really caught his interest, but fortunately he knew someone he could turn to. It's Bob Ross on Channel 5. And this is how you paint a cat. Meanie. You know I can't stand them. And you know it's me who I'll take who will have to take care of her, after all, basically living in the office. Ethan never liked cats, and the dogs too, not much difference. He didn't like the very idea of keeping a predator at home, even a small one. He couldn't quite explain why. Even so, the face of Persian cats, deeply depressed and equally concave, still lingered before his mind's eye. He knew it wasn't over yet. Hope is not one to give in this easy. She never was, and for him, there was something incredibly appealing about it. Come to think of it, quite possible it'll be him, him who captured, who capitulates in the end. In a relationship, you always have to sacrifice something. In four and a half years, or even five, according to Hope, he had learned this quite well. Suddenly, Hope frowned, looking at the screen. Seems like you got an email from, uh, damn, tough one, I can't quite read it. Just hit your work mailbox. Let me see. Hope I got a new project. The Middle Ages are fine and all, but they are about to start pouring out of my ears. Ethan reached for his laptop, but Hope grabbed it and dodged him. Right. Why don't we talk about contracts on a Sunday evening? So, which one of us is all work and no play? Hmm. Well, such are the benefits of freelance. Well, I give it back. Hope giggled and leaned over the armrest hanging onto the floor. Hope's defenses withstood several more attacks each time Ethan thought the laptop would definitely hit the floor. Then she gave Ethan a quick peck on the cheek and slid off the couch. The laptop returned to its owners. I mean, what if they'll actually give you a new contract but on the same old Middle Ages? Now that would be a twist. Yeah, a hilarious one. Oh, I have to fucking save. 
What up? How long is this game? saving. 